we are starting up a um, new seminar series called What's After PhD. Now, how did this all come about was um, because, you know, for most of us who are finishing or have finished your PhD, sometimes the question everyone asks you is always, so what are you going to do after this? And you say, I'm going to maybe go for a postdoc. And what about after that? You know, another postdoc. And you keep applying for more postdocs till you eventually become a professor one day in your old age. But then the thing is, is, you know, if we take a look at Spree, we don't really have space for everybody to become a professor here. So naturally, maybe some of us have an interest of going outside, doing something else. So this initiative we are starting is to bring back our research alumni. So all the speakers would have gone through what you are either doing or you've already done and get them to share their experience about what they have gone through. Um, notably and specifically, people that are not postdocs here. So today, um, we've got ourselves uh, three speakers that have come in from, some from overseas. So we have a, we'll be going through the introduction uh, very soon. And speakers, I'll have you take your seats, maybe right now. Um, and before we officially begin, I would also like to acknowledge um, to UV, uh, Moon Yong, and Ran for helping me plan and arrange the event, uh, brainstorming for the whole thing, as well as uh, support from the postgraduate committee of Spree and the head of school and the school manager for being supportive with this. All right, so um, we've got our three speakers here. Let's have a bit of an introduction. Um, maybe I'll ask some questions. All right, so firstly, uh, let's introduce yourselves. Who are you and who do you work for currently? Or at least with your experience. So everybody, good afternoon, this is Alex Lee. So previously I was a student, PhD student here um, at Spree. And afterwards when I graduated, I worked for Jinko Solar for two and a half years for utility solar farm. And afterwards I got recruited back to UNSW to take the role of knowledge exchange as the business development manager. So basically my role and responsibility is uh, my responsibility is to help researchers to realize what can be commercialized, what sort of industrial impact can they make in their research and help them to bring the value to the industry. So this is what I do. Good afternoon, my name is Ray Shen. I did my PhD here in Spray. Uh, on Prosket Solar Cell in 2013. Um, that's the time when Prosket really starts. Uh, back then, I thought Prosket will take like half, at least 50 years to get into market. But the by the time I graduate, I joined um, a startup company in China. We're based in Hangzhou. It's a very beautiful city. Um, so basically, we do commercial. We're trying to commercialize Prosket Solar Cell, and currently we hold some. Uh, we record efficiency for uh, Prosket solar modules, and uh, my role in the company is uh, I'm the CTO in the company, and uh, I'm in charge of uh, the research and development. Um, yeah, that's basically what I do. Uh, hey guys, uh, my name is Xin Yu Zhang. Um, I recognize quite a few people here. I'm a bachelor graduate from UNSW Spree. And I'm currently working for Jinko Solar. Uh, we are the um, number one in terms of shipment for the past three years uh, for crystallized silicon PV panels. And I'm now in charge of the um, solar cell R&D in Jinko. <coughs> okay, so um, could you tell me what aspect of your current job do you enjoy the most? So one of the very important and interesting features about my job is to learn about many of the cutting edge technology that we develop in this building. And the other part is that I need to identify or realize the commercial value of the technology or, or the research that we are doing here. And I need to find the feedback from the industry, what people are thinking about us, what is their, their actual market demand, feed this information back to our university and help the researchers to make a decision where they should go next 
to make more industrial impact. So this is the most in interesting part about my job. Identi identify the cutting edge technology, help people to commercialize it. Um, so for me, the most, uh, the most enjoyable part for me is um, because I, I used to do research in university and when I was doing my PhD, I make ProfScat solar cell myself from glass to the final device. And it takes up to a, a, a week to make it happen. But when I joined the company, I feel like everything happens so fast. We do five batches of cell and modules every day at least. So I feel like if you want to see something happen, a uh, company is, uh, seems like a better option. That's the part I uh, enjoyed most. Uh, actually, sim very similar to, to uh, Ray, that I think I enjoy the most of part. Uh, the best part is probably to see what we develop and what we, what we research become the real product, to see it's actually being sold and to see that actually there are people using our work, using the product we develop. For example, the last year we developed a star product called Cheetah. Alex must know that has been accumulatedly sold uh, for about uh, two billion U.S. dollars, so that's uh, it's quite few, quite achieving um, to see that something we actually come out of the lab and become production line product, and then it's actually um, well, many people, hundreds, thousand people are using that. Yeah, that's the best part. Okay, um, that's pretty interesting. Now, so we've gone through our introductions. What we're going to be focusing on now is discussing the types of experiences that you've got since you've left the university. If anybody in the audience also has any questions that you would like to bring up, I encourage you just raise your hand up. We'll have uh, it's an open panel discussion. So if you feel like you have anything that you want to say, <coughs> um, just you know, yeah, let us know. So let's uh, begin with the first question. Now. Could you share with us the story of uh, when and why did you move out of academia when you graduated into an industrial position? How did you end up getting to this, you know, from when you graduate? Start from the other side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. What? Uh, how come the order change? <laughs> That's all right. <clears throat> um, well, a little bit... Um, story that I, uh, I was very lucky to do a project with uh, uh, Dr. Lennon, uh, Professor Lennon, congratulations. <laughs> and during that time, I, I, I realized I have a quite a big gap um, like uh, from academia uh, understanding of the solar cell. So I, I did my PhD. Um, uh, so uh, Alison introduced me to Professor Andreas Quivas and I did my PhD with him uh, studying some uh, fundamentals and some theory of solar cells and I enjoyed a lot and after that I realized I think something oh okay I understand more about solar cell but how it really works and how it's it's being built in the in the in the in the factory so I, I want to understand more so that's pretty much the motivation I have to to uh, use what I learned during my research and use it in the real life but also the uh, another trigger is to um, Jinko happens to have a position vacant um, that to have uh, looking for research people who's uh, working on advanced cell structures, particular uh, passivity, passivity contact solar cell uh, structures. So I happen to be in this area. So this is more like a mashup of uh, both parties uh, requirements. Um, for me, it's a bit different because I think as a female in academia, in the beginning, I didn't plan to go to industry at all. I finished my PhD and I had a opportunity in a very good university to do a postdoc. Um, but it's, it's a university overseas, so it took me some time to get visa done and everything. I was waiting in China and uh, the founder actually uh, sent me uh, called me said just come to the company and have a look if if you like it so I went to Hangzhou and I spent two months there and I see how things actually done in a real company maybe back then it's not really real it's only like 10 people but still 
the research passion I see in a startup company really attracted me. So I decided after two months, I decided to stay, and uh, here I am. So my story is not as exciting as these two. So <laughs> my story is when I when I graduated from my PhD, I started have a feeling that, hey, my question is, what does people think about us? What does people walking in Ansborough think about us? Do they know what we are doing? Do they know what is solar? Do they know how to use a solar cell? So I started have a I have a feeling that I wanted to become the bridge be between technology or science and normal people, normal community people. And that's why I joined the role in Jingo Australia to become the technical service manager. It's basically a technical sales role to take care of the utility solar farm. And one of the very interesting experience that, that I found out is that for most of us sitting in this room, you know a lot more than 99.9% .9 people in the field. Because those people, they are when, when people are building a solar farm, <coughs> They know nothing about a solar panel, but they, are eager, but they are eager to learn. They want to learn things from us. They want to know how to use a solar panel. When seeing you develop a new panel and sell it, to the, sell it to the field, people's impression is that, hey, why are you having a new panel? They don't understand the benefit of the new technology. Just like they don't understand what we are doing, what we are doing here, what benefit that researchers are trying to bring to the industry. So that is why I wanted to be the bridge between, in, between the industry and the technology. And it finds, it, it finds out that we were doing pretty good mm. as the matchup between yeah. industry and people at the front. So Jingo Australia, in, in the, the past few years, we are always the first one in the Jingo department to make a successful deal of the very cutting edge technology. For example, half cell, split cell, or what we say, cheetah, or the first bifacial solar cell, solar bifacial module solar farm in the world. So that is a very interesting part that I enjoy a lot in my first part of my career. Okay, thanks. That's all a very interesting story. So, um, you've spent most of your time, you know, in school, studying in a university, and as we all know, even here in Spree, the type of freedoms that we get and the working environment is very different from when you go out and you start working for a company. So could you share with us what kind of challenges you were facing when you first started in the industry? I can start. So I come to pick. <laughs> do, do you want to start? No, no. I can let, me, start. Let, let me start, let me start. So my experience will be a bit different to these two, ladies and gentlemen, because I worked in a more a commercialization arm of a of, of Jingo Solar before. And even though after I jumped back to the university, but it still it's more like a commercialization role. So my experience is that when you're working in a enterprise or a company, you have all the stress to make a deal regardless what of what effort you, you may want to take. People are just telling you that, hey Alex, get this done. Hey Alex, get this deal done. So that is very different from what we are having at the university. In the university, you have all the freedom to do what you want to do. Making a project, well, it, maybe it will success, maybe it will fail. When it fails, you just have to tell your boss that because of reason A, B, C, D, or assumption A, B, C, D, this project will fail, so we don't do this again. But in the industry, in, at least in my, in, in, my, in my experience, we don't have that opportunity to fail. You have to make sure that everything you do, you have set up your own strategy, you have set up your own path to you know, tailor your, your, your strategy to a success. So <coughs> that was the most challenging part. Another thing is that when people graduated from Spree, the most common te terminology that you're familiar with is minority carrier lifetime, <laughs> passivation, surface recombination velocity, you know, bad surface feel, anti-reflection coating. But when you work in the industry, nobody knows what you are talking about. So you have to tailor yourself, tailor your mindset to allow yourself to communicate with them in an effective way, in a language that both of us can understand. For example, just tell them, hey, use the split cell that you develop. You can increase your financial re return of investment by X percentage then they will understand. So this is a, another very important part, how you convert technology to a financial gain. And I believe that most of us in this room are capable to do that. 
Thank you. Um, I agree with Alex. Uh, for me, it's it's very similar. When I go, when I w just run to the industry, and it's not actually industry. We're still a, a startup company, and we are now only have uh, some showcase uh, project with government, but we still don't have products in the market. It will be there soon, but still on the way. Mm, so what, by the time I joined the company, we have only ten people, and. I've as a as a CTO, so, but CTO means I have to do everything myself. I have to do HR. I have to talk to my engineers. I have to do everything, even cleaning thing for my staff because they are busy in the lab. So the first um, challenge I face is how to uh, take place in this kind of role. Um, how to talk to investors because I don't know about. Australian investor, but most of Chinese investor, they have no idea what technology is. They have a lot of money. They want to make more money, so they want to invest their money to a company or a group of people with potential. So, <coughs> as a technical person, I have to talk to them in a simple way to explain why my our technology has uh, the benefit. Um, so this is the first part I think is very challenging for me. The second is, like I, uh, like I mentioned earlier, when I was a PhD student, we do solar cell every week for one batch. But in the company, I got many reports every day. So I have to be a quick, a quick thinker to analyze and to decide whether we go this direction or the other one. In university, we have time to think, but in industry, we have to, we have to be quick. Um, I think uh, there are many challenges. Uh, if I have to pick one, I think I will go very detailed to, uh, I would say, the, the technology-wise design or strategy design and also the budgeting. So I find that's very challenging because we are the trigger of our new product and our roadmap in the future of product roadmap. And uh, we'll pretty much, our R&D department will decide whether we will be uh, whether we will be successful or not, so that's that we need to do very careful budgeting about what direction we should invest on and what kind of uh, people uh, we should set up, set up group for, and um, so this all uh, will be sync at least two years ahead of what's actually will be in in the reality. So to think, uh, to focus what's going to be hap happening in two years is very challenging. I think we have to do it every day, pretty much. We need to know what we are in short of, and so what, uh, what kind of area we need to put more resource in, and uh, where we should spend most of the time next year. So this is, I think, uh, we, I'm currently I'm doing some budgeting for next year, so I feel quite stressed at the moment. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, that's uh, pretty interesting. Now, something for all the current students and maybe even the staff here. So, um, <clears throat> here's, here's a question for you. Do you feel that do you have any skills that you've developed in your PhD that is highly applicable to your work in the industry? And on top of that, would you give any advice on what kind of skills a student or even a current staff in academia should focus on and develop if they were to, you know, any skills that you find that is suitable for work outside of the university? Um, I think that my biggest um, outcome from my PhD is not my thesis. It's about the confidence when, you, when you're dealing with a brand new problem that nobody's seeing you believe that you have the capability to solve the problem. You believe that you can search the information and address the issue and find out a solution. And you are, uh, and you are not scared. And I believe that this is the biggest strength that I got from my PhD, rather than what I learned from solar cell, rather than what I learned from writing my thesis. Because in real reality, when I believe that we will agree that when you, when, you join a, when you join the industry, most of the things that we learn, it is a background knowledge, but probably you won't use it again. It's based on the background knowledge you build on top of that. You, you learn many new stuff when you're working. For example, how to budget. For example, how to manage your people. 
for example, how to build a financial mod model based on a brand new PV panel. So these are the, 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 the confidence and skills that I developed during our PhD. You're not afraid. And other skills that I would, re I would recommend us to look at is identify the demand of your audience and talk accordingly in their own language. Because in my pre previous role, and even my current role, I talk, I, I, I present role shows to many countries and many, many audiences from very different backgrounds. From the face and from the face impression, I try to identify, are they listening to me? Are they with me? Are they understanding what I'm talking about? If I sense that they are not with me, I need to change my language. I need to change to a way that they can understand what I'm talking about. Finance people, we talk about investment. Managing people, we talk about how to improve the working efficiency. For solar cell people, we talk about how we improve your passivation quality. And for module people, we talk, module means solar panel, in case you don't understand. For module people, we talk about reliability and durability. And of course, the price of a solar panel. So you need to identify what your people is after and try to adjust their demand rather than your own interest. So for me, it's quite different because I don't, in my daily uh, duty, I don't really need to talk to other uh, outside people. I, the, the people I talk most is to uh, the collaborators and also the engineers in the company. But I feel um, during my PhD, the, the knowledge I got from about ProfSkyde is, is very important for my current job. But other than that, I feel like how to collaborate and how to talk to potential uh, collaborators is, is also important. Uh, for example, I did some visiting <coughs> research when I was doing my PhD in Monash University and, and also uh, uh, in, uh, in Oxford University as well. So during that time, because ProfSkyde only starts, it only starts from 2012, so the, the help I can get from a, a group of people is very, very limited. I have to ask for help from uh, to, to, the, to the scientists in the world, to the top researchers in the world. It's a similar uh, thing for me in the company because uh, there is no ProScan panels or products in the, in the market. So there, there are some things we don't know and there is no people in the company would know if we don't ask. So I think for me, the advice I give uh, to the students and the staff is just don't be afraid, just ask, ask for help. I think uh, we are all in the industry, so we have very similar feelings. Uh, I agree with the previous uh, two speakers that um, the, the skill of talking to people is very important. And uh, I think I gained a lot of experience during, during my PhD is um, uh, because I had a monthly review with my supervisor, so every month I need to gather all the results and all the reasoning, all the uh, literature research and whatever, try to persuade, try to persuade him to believe what I think is happening. So I think I can quite a, quite a lot of experience in, into trying uh, per, um, persuading people. Um, but after going to the um, uh, into the industry, I think things um, become a bit differently. Although the, the target is the same, is trying to persuade people. But the, um, so it's not like um, talking to people and uh, say, oh, this is what I believe and this is what I, I see. So listen and, uh, and think about it and believe it. It, it never happens like you. Uh, it's always you have to think <coughs> from your audience point of view. You need to understand what they are thinking and uh, what do they want to hear and what they are expect, uh, expecting. Then you can understand then from what way and from what kind of point of view to trigger in, then you can persuade him. I think that's, uh, that's another kind of experience that I learned a lot uh, during working in the industry because we are talking to all kinds of people. Talk to my engineers, talk to the, to the boss, investors, uh, customers, and also technical support people. Um, this you have to think use different strategies talking to different people yeah and but that's I think that's what we learn a lot from PhD because um, during PhD we learn how to reasoning the, the thing yeah okay. pretty good.
No. Before we move on, does anyone in the audience have anything that you wish to ask? It's alright. You keep on thinking about it while we move on, just in case you have anything like more personal. Yes, one. Um, hang on. You mean to get on the microphone? We will. We'll take care of that. Wow. <laughs> Another tough question. Do you think if you would have joined the industry three years before finishing your PhD, so be, instead of doing a PhD, we have changed the way you're working now? Can you repeat the question again? Yeah. Okay. So you do you do your PhD three years later you have your PhD three and a half right you have your PhD you join the industry and then you have a lot of learning experience uh, that brings you to the role you're doing now. What if you started doing the industry before doing the PhD? Really change the way you're working in your role now. A PhD is helping you to build up very strong fundamental background knowledge about how to build a solar cell, how to build a solar panel. My advice is that from my experience, when I walk into a meeting room, some of the customer is basically our alumni, but they graduate after their graduation from a bachelor, they join the industry for utility solar farm development. So experience and, ba and, and background knowledge, both of them are very important. Depends on what you want to do. If you say that today, I want to develop a solar farm, I want to become an EPC or a developer, you don't really need a PhD. But of course, if you have a PhD, I'm sure that you will take advantage of your confidence and your knowledge to, be, to become very, a, a very good worker or, or, or staff, a, a, a role player in, your, in, the, in the solar farm company. But it does not mean that you have to or you don't have to have a PhD. So either way, it's a good way. But you need to think about what you want to do. For me, it's a very simple question. If I don't do a PhD and join the industry, there won't be an industry. Because back to 2013, there is no company doing ProSky. So for me, is I don't have an option. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think, I do think, because we're still uh, trying to recruit people from all over the world to make better ProSky mo solar modules, but we prefer they have uh, at least a master degree on the s on the field in the field yeah, to have a fundamental mm. knowledge. Uh, well, I think the answer is very clear. It will be very different, um, both from my experience or uh, also my um, uh, recruitment uh, experience <coughs> with the engineers, and I probably much have uh, hired. Uh, close to maybe a hundred engineers and uh, some of them uh, are PhD, some of our master graduates. Um, just uh, from a general understanding of uh, performance wise, uh, they perform differently. Um, I think the most, uh, the, the most clear difference is the, the ability to work independently. So normally I feel more comfortable of giving a uh, small task uh, with uh, time restrictions to a um, PhD engineer, what we call a our our, our own uh, we call it uh, PhD trainers within our system, and I feel the uh, more comfortable of um, working on a small task by themselves, have the plan, have the resource um, uh, to be um, you know to apply for the resource and uh, recruit people to work on that. For uh, for many master degree student, I feel they are more they are very skilled and they they are very happy to work things very hard, but uh, they tend to more like uh, uh, to have uh, orders have plan, and um, before they 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 do their own design and then they can do a very good job, but once they they want to do uh, more like um, they need to work on the uh, by their own to have some independent planning. Sometimes it's not working as good as PhD uh, graduates. That's a general uh, impression, but they are also top ones from uh, this uh, master graduation as well. I think, yeah. I would like to add a bit from here. So we cannot forget one fact is that usually when you graduate, when you graduate from PhD, you are older than a master graduate. So you are a more ma you are a more <coughs> mature person. If you have two years more to gather your experience after your master or bachelor graduation, 
you can become a very competitive player in the field as well. So it's about experience and of course your background knowledge. Yeah. Okay, thanks, that's a very good question. Does anyone else have any? Ooh, a lot of questions, all right. Um, <laughs> Okay, let's let's start. Okay, maybe let's do it this way. Do you want to have a question that's open to either of the speakers, or if you have one that's specifically to one of them, um, considering that the three of them are doing different types of roles, uh, you may also um, state. I guess let's start with um, let's let's start with Danny. You. So my question must be very general, like to all the speaker. So you say like like the work in the industry and academic is kind of different. For example, when you work in the academic, you can be fail, and then you tell your supervisor, okay, because of this and that, it, it failed, and then your supervisor is kind of accepted. But then when you work with the company, have you ever experienced something fail? For example, you set a target for one year plan that you want to achieve, but you can't. And then is there like, have you ever failed? And then if you are really well, what did you do to that? Yeah, for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I said not. Uh, okay. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, we pretty much fail every day. So the the um, of of course not what my boss want to hear. But um, <laughs> basically, we have a general target. For example, we have a yearly increasing uh, efficiency increasing target, probably point three to point and uh, point five, something like that. But uh, we never uh, bet uh, our target on one direction. So we always try different directions. When I, uh, uh, three years ago, when I uh, check, check all the progress of our R&D project, we found our success rate is around um, 80, 82, something like the, the achievement uh, over the uh, investment. And then uh, after discussion with the boss, we think that's too high. Um, success rate of above 80, that means we are uh, too careful. So after that, we change the strategy a little bit to, we should try to be a brief and try to be a more explosive and uh, allow some uh, failure, uh, but the target should be more clear. So that's the, the way we are, are working now. So I, I can't tell what's the success rate for now, but I do know that some project we are uh, investing on and we are working on, we are more uh, looking at uh, trying to step into one area and to see how it goes. We don't have a clear target, but uh, we, we have to achieve it. But the overall target is always set. So, um, for me, is for startup companies, failure is, 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 is even worse because we can't afford f any big failure. So basically, I remember some time, uh, because we we try we're sh still trying to build the first uh, production line for in the world to produce Prosket solar modules. Um, there is no equipment in the market designed for that, so we have to be part of the design team so w to work with the equipment supplier <coughs> to to try to set up a, a pilot line. But during uh, that process, we feel there's a lot of failure. The equipment delivered and it doesn't perform as we expected or we need some other pro uh, process that means we need more money <coughs> so it's more like a job for my CEO to ask more money from the investors but my job is just to <coughs> excuse me to uh, make sure it doesn't happen too often to think as much as I can to uh, equip this uh, line this production equipment, uh, this this equipment to perform as good as we it's expected. I agree with seeing you that you can fail in one hand, but you better tell me that you have another hand with some other preparation. So overall, you're heading towards a good direction. Okay, um, read um. Hi to all of you, thanks for taking out your time to come here. So uh, all of you mentioned that somehow your PhD helped you, but the thesis as such is maybe not too relevant to what you're working or not so important, except in the case, I think, of one of you who took their, uh, your Perovskite project into uh, your company. 
So is there any other uh, skills that you think is very important that we need to acquire? Because during the PhD, uh, you're so engrossed into your thesis, but I think uh, parallelly, you can also develop some skills which later on after the graduation will also be important and maybe of relevance to help you get a job in industry. Do you think there's any such key skills that we could during these three and a half long years develop it parallelly to our thesis? Okay, I can, I can, I can start. Uh, yeah, lady first. <laughs> uh, I think for me, uh, Communication is very important because when I was doing my PhD, I only we only got one chance to go overseas to attend conference. Um, but during during my time for the last three years in the company, I went to a lot of conferences. And what I see is many students, many PhD students actually go, but they don't talk. They don't talk to other people. They don't know. They they listen to the presentations. They s look at the papers and they look at the posters, but they don't talk to each other. They don't. They only talk to the people they are familiar with. So I think what is important for them, for us, is to talk to different people and to see what is happening in the world. Um, and uh, it gives you a lot of opportunity to see more and to get more from them. Um, I'll talk in more technical wise. I think uh, um, because most of us in uh, working in the PV uh, area, I think uh, the skill of uh, doing simulation is quite important. Uh, not, not only because you, you need to understand uh, more like uh, the structure or the background, or, um, but also it allows <coughs> you to understand what are the assumptions before you make the simulation. You need to do know what models uh, you are uh, you are following, and so that you know that the whether this mo then you can, but on the same time you need to uh, also learn to challenge the old uh, experience and uh, learning because you need to know that th whether this model is working and what the assumptions behind this model. If it's not something we we currently use now, then this is something area some area you can step into that to change the model whatever. But overall, uh, this you how to do the simulation is is a very good uh, experience and uh, learn um, for for understanding all all what we study. Yeah. Any simulation in particular? Sorry. Any simulation in particular? Uh, which simulation? Uh, yes, for the most. Yeah. Well, um, given the experience of my my part, because uh, I mainly work on the uh, crystallized silicon uh, area, so. Um, uh, we need to learn how to use simulation to understand how solar cell works. For example, uh, we use uh, the most uh, common tools we use is COCA. And, and also we sometimes use Gridler as well, uh, but COCA is more often. So by doing all the COCA practice, we, we understand uh, what is uh, going on. Because a lot of assumptions are not, any, are not true anymore. So our daily job is trying to challenge and trying to understand the, whether this simulation, whether this mo uh, uh, model is working anymore. It's pretty much a very common job for us. Yeah. Okay, um, so Derwin, do you want to have one? We'll just have one last question before I move on to the uh, next set. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much for the talk. So uh, I just want to ask a very general question to all three of you is, when we all doing a PhD, we obviously have spent a lot of time during that program acquiring the skill that we cannot acquire industry, which is more knowledge based. But when it comes to interview, uh, do you consider a PhD as working experience? Or do you see, let's say, someone that started in the industry much earlier, but acquire all those skills through the industry compared to a PhD? What do you value more and how how can a PhD student compete against them? I think you're the best person. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's variable, I mean, the evaluation. And um, this very long term uh, experience, such as maybe a, like a 10 year experience, it probably doesn't make much difference. Well, whether you have a PhD or not. Um, but with like a relatively less experience and uh, having a PhD is quite important. 
So just um, like we will stick to the fact. So we have a different salary levels for for the entry level of a PhD. Whether you have uh, if you have a PhD, you have a relatively good entry level. Um, but when as you you um, but after that, um, maybe five years later, whether uh, what's your salary will will highly depend on the achievement within the work, not only the the graduation certificate you have. Yeah. Okay. Um, sure. One, one more from Alison. Um, so given what you know now and what you're doing now, how do you think uh, the PhD program, well, what changes would you like to see in the PhD program to prepare you better for your current roles? Hmm. That's a very good, good question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you go start. Maybe I will give it a go. So, Considering my background is my experience is a bit different from Xin Yu. I'm more from the commercialization arm of a, of Jingo Solo before and now from UNSO Bill. That I will share one of my experiences that one of my our competitor well we were competitor as also friends as well. They told me face to face that PhD, I know that you guys are very smart, you are damn smart. But in our factory we got tons of you guys. But if you can combine your knowledge with some commercial sense to tell people hey how I can take advantage of this technology you worth thousands more that's what they told me face to face so I'm not sure where that should be incorporated in, into a PhD program but also think about what is the implication or what impact can we bring to the industry by doing a certain research of course fundamental research is very important but in the long shot what would be the potential what would be the pot potential benefit from a fundamental research? I mean, writing a thesis, we can write many things, but really think about it. What can we make out of it? Uh, okay. Um, I think uh, one thing I do uh, notice that I think uh, this uh, current PhD program a little bit towards in the publication side. So uh, we do uh, evaluate a lot about if you have a lot of publications and very good publications but I think it could be uh, a modif uh, modified a little bit towards in also the project wise so um, we also we need to understand the fundamentals we need to have the understanding of uh, the theory and then have the publication but that's mostly based on oh okay something I find out and then I should public publish it but we can combine a little bit this um, like a, a, a more like a target a project targeting kind of program such as I need to achieve something and how can I do it so it might it shouldn't be the whole part of your PhD but it should we should try to practice a little bit during this PhD I might don't know how to do it but at least uh, at least have the target there and I will try to accomplish this target so that's something I think uh, we can try to practice a little bit yeah I think for me is um, I think for spray, uh, silicon solar cell is uh, very strong and uh, uh, a lot of connections to the industry. But other than silicon solar cell, at least in spray, what I feel like is we are not that close to industry. Um, I think most of people in the room is working. Uh, on silicon solar cell, but maybe there are some people still working on like fundamental knowledge of uh, emerging PV, like CCTS, like uh, Proscat as well. Um, what I feel is also important is if <coughs> you feel, um, if you want to join industry afterwards, uh, start thinking now and start uh, equip yourself about um, the industrial knowledge um, in this field. Actually, uh, one, one comment about the CV, if you guys are preparing for that, I think it's something, um, publication is a very good thing. Uh, but from my, my experience and also uh, many people I talk to, they, they value a lot about the program you have actually finished. And, the, and you know, it's some, some of uh, the fan, uh, formal for our project from maybe uh, uh, state funding or whatever, but you can always set up your, your work into several projects and try to describe how you finish one project. 
that is uh, will be considered very valuable in in the CV rather than just having the publication instead. Yeah, so that's a really good question because I was about to ask you about how your opinion of the impact of your work has changed naturally within our research. You know, having more publications, conference presentations, and that kind of thing, it works very well with the university because that's how we qualify research impact. But really, when you hear from the speakers, once you go out there, these things may not be as <coughs> important as you once thought was the case. Um, let's move on to something quickly. We're getting close to about uh, one o'clock. So, um, very let's ask an interesting question. Would you ever think about coming back? Take a postdoc after you've had your experience out there doing <coughs> these things. Alex? He has okay. already come back. <laughs> <laughs> so, do I consider have been back? No, the, to answer the question is that, consider what you want to do. It will say that I want to be focused a lot in the fundamental research of a project, of a certain technology, then I would recommend that, yeah, it's, it's good to go back to do a postdoc when you can spend a lot of time, a lot of failures, a lot of energy in only one for project, then you may consider doing a postdoc. If you say that, oh, I want to dedicate more to the industry, make things work, bring this idea alive and use it in the production line. And I probably would recommend you, you know, send your CV to Xinyu and Ray. If you, if, if you say that, oh, I want to see how the people are really using solar, how much energy that I can get out of this solar panel rather than the power that you measure in your standard lab, then probably you might consider going to the international developers or even local EPC or some of the third-party consultant because your knowledge is highly in demand. So that would be my recommendation whether you should go back for a postdoc or not. I think it all depends on what kind of life you choose to have. Um, so working in industry is different, especially working um, in a startup company. We have no after, our after work time. So basically, I'm on call 24-7. My engineer needs me, I have to be there. My boss needs me, I have to be there. So if that's the life you would like to have, but that's only the dark side, but the bright side, <laughs> the bright <laughs> side is you see your stuff from lab to the pallet line, to the, uh, to the production line, then to the market. It's very interesting and exciting to see that process, but the trade-off you have to take is personal life. I think if you choose to have that kind of life <coughs> go to industry, but if you want to have a relatively stable life, I think academia is a is the most sensible a sensible option. But I feel like there is there, there are many uh, industry uh, research institute or in research organizations in big uh, companies as well. I think go go either e which sorry either way either lifestyle you choose is. Is there is no harm to go to industry and have a look? Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of um, research, I, I think I never go very far. I think my job, part of my job, is still doing research either within the company or working with our partners, and I also uh, teach some courses in some local universities, and I I feel I quite close to student and also research, so I don't think I'm that far away. But in terms of um, whether to come back for uni, I think um, just personal-wise, I, I, I work a lot in the front, uh, front part of the, the device and the product uh, developing. Uh, so my interest, my future interest will, I, I, I feel um, I want to move a little bit to the application side, quite a few, so that maybe will get me a bit further from uh, uni yeah. and whatever, but I think that's something I don't know, so I feel have interest to, to step into a little bit. Yeah. Maybe I can share one more idea here to get you excited about how the industry will work. What we are making at the uni is a solar cell with like that much of a size. You will never put it in your rooftop to generate electricity, but when you're working in the industry, like in Xinyu's company, you're dealing with 
18 gigawatt of solar panels each year. Mm -hmm. When you're working okay. in an e developer com company, you're dealing with 200 megawatt solar farm in one project. So if you have been to all, all those solar farm, if you drive a car around that solar farm, around it, it takes you like 40 minutes by driving a car. Look at the massive scale. Look at the impact. One of the solar farm, like the Sunraysia solar farm, it can totally support the electricity consumption of the U University of New South Wales. Look at how much knowledge that you can contribute to the industry, and that would be a huge impact. Look at that scale, and look at the lab scale. If you say that I want to dedicate into the solar cell, make it much, much better, come back to uni. If you say that I want to make a better module, a better solar cell in the industrial scale, go to the industry. If you say that I want to help the people to take advantage of a solar panel, generate more electricity, go to the developer com companies. That would be my suggestion. Okay, thank you. So, um, let's just have one last bit. If you could tell the audience the one thing that they want to take away from coming to this seminar, what would it be? Just one key advice. I mean, you've already given lots of advice. But if there was one thing they have to remember, what would that be? <laughs> uh, a very, very simple advice. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to talk to people. Don't be afraid to make a change. And don't, don't be afraid to, to, be fail, uh, to be fail. We're still young. We're super young. We can afford failure. Yeah, that's my advice. Uh, I'm not that young anymore. You look young. Well, um, I think uh, when I, I thought about this question a lot <laughs> yesterday night, and uh, I think uh, I tried to have a list of a few options. I finally, I, I finally I decided to go with the like how to calm down. I think calm down is a very. I think it's a very very valuable um, actually character of a person who. You, you know, to uh, we will face challenges, face difficulties all the time, but we normally choose to think about and the, or face the challenge straight away and very point to point um, <coughs> respond to the challenge and also the difficulty, but that's actually not the best way. Normally we need to learn down and do all the anal analysis and think about all the problems and think about what resource I have and then make a decision. So it may happen very quickly, within one minute or within several seconds, but to cool your down and to be very, very um, calm to think about this is, is a very good, uh, I think it's a very important thing. I think you, you might experience things and you may go back and think about what I mentioned. <laughs> you will find it's very valuable. I hope think people can understand this. Uh, the message uh, that I want you to take home from me is a bit longer probably. So what we are doing here is highly important. We are basically the gold place of PV. But what we are focusing here is a solar cell. But if you look at the entire value chain of the solar industry, you start with the silicon, you start with the glass, then you make the solar cell. By making the solar cell, you have the metal paste, you have the PCVD machine. You have the glass, you have the EVA encapsulant, you have the back sheet, you have the aluminum frame, and of course you need to integrate a junction box to the back of the solar cell, of the solar panel, and you may have your micro inverter. All these are in the value chain. And if you look at the solar farm, you have the tracker system, you have the inverters, you need to analyze how much power and how much energy that you are trying to get from this solar farm. All this value chain that we I think we have the knowledge to tap our hands on rather than just focusing on a solar cell or a solar panel. I'm not saying that what we are doing is not important. What we are doing here is the original point of all these other value chains. Without what we are doing here, what I have, I have, all those components I have just mentioned will be vanished. But all those components, they need our contribution. They need our impact. And I think you should look at those rather than just focusing on solar cell. So that would be my take-home message for you. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, if we could thank our speakers, round of applause for coming and taking the time to join us. Um, now, we've got, if uh, the next one hour, we've got refreshments outside. It's also kind of like lunch. Um, 
I do hope we have enough for everyone because I've made the catering based on the registration numbers. And um, so we can be out there. The speakers will be outside mingling around as well if you'd wish to speak with them directly. Now, one more thing I need to bring up. This uh, seminar session, we'll be having it probably a number of times over the next year or so. And we are also looking into getting speakers that have come in from the other aspects of Spree, like the renewable energies, not just photovoltaics all the time, but we'll have people that come in that are doing energy systems. We've even arranged to prepare speakers that are not even doing engineering anymore. So you've got a PhD in photovoltaics, renewable energy, but you're off doing, you know, setting up your bakery. And how does that help you with that? So we do have uh, sessions that we are preparing to get, you know, a much more wider variety of speakers that regardless of what it is that they are doing now, they can be in some other field entirely. But the one thing that we have in common is that everyone's come from here. So we have a, in a sense, a unified background that we can relate to each other. Oh, I graduated from Spree 15 years ago with a PhD. What have I done since then? So um, I would probably say um, over the next year, keep a lookout, we'll be sending out more invites to these and um, I'd probably also be releasing a bit of a feedback survey because we'd like to know what we can do to improve on this uh, series. If there's anything in particular that you are looking for, uh, that will be very helpful for helping us to plan um, the whole session. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for coming down for this and we've got you know, food outside, you can hang around to chit chat if you wish to. Um, guess that'd be all for now. Thanks. Thank you.